morning and happy Sabbath, church family. It's a blessing to be with you once more. I was encouraged by the uh, children's story this morning, knowing that if the Lord can speak through a donkey, that uh, he can speak through me this morning. And of course, he promises uh, he can make the rocks cry out if he needs to. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, We're continuing on our series this morning, Curtain Call, The Final Acts of Earth's History. And uh, we are concluding our message from last Sabbath. Uh, If you were here last week, uh, the message was called The Conclusive Cast of Christ. Now, the irony is not lost on me that we didn't come to a conclusion last week and that we have to uh, finish it off this week, but I think it will actually add to uh, the message uh, that we have this morning as well. So last week, we looked at the inception and the continuation of the church as started by Jesus Christ and continued on by his followers. And uh, they proclaimed, of course, the the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of his soon return. And uh, it was interesting because we saw as far back as 85 to 100 AD, this is only like 40 or 50 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, that there would be a falling away from what Jesus had set up before he returns. And of course, this is what we saw in history as as we went through the history of the church. And we saw that the church went off the rails a little bit. We saw this deformation come into the church uh, for some time before, of course, Luther came in and uh, got things back on track again. He started a conversation, what he hoped would just be a conversation uh, that obviously soon became uh, an argument, a debate that uh, sparked the Protestant Reformation. Uh, But as we saw last week, uh, over time, God revealed more and more truth uh, to his people. And this is why we see this succession of churches over time. Uh, Like I said last week, the Adventist Adventist church stands uh, on the shoulders of these giants that came before us. Amen? These men like um, Huss and Jerome and Wesley and, and Calvin, all of these guys... We stand on their shoulders. But we see through history with each successive truth that would come along, a group would remain where they were instead of growing along with these new truths. And uh, we figured out last week that the church is a movement. Amen? The church is a movement and it keeps moving. It doesn't stop. But often throughout history, the history of the church, we see uh, groups that get tied down by traditionalism by denominationalism. And you'll remember that we looked at this great quote from um, Pelican, the Christian historian, where he said, tradition is the living faith of the dead, but traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. These men like Luther and Wesley, etc., they have come and gone, and the light that they lived up to in a very powerful way holds them in great stead for when Jesus returns. Amen? But for some who built up their denominations uh, around these great men, uh, where their faith is rooted in traditionalism, you know, they might be found themselves wanting when Jesus returns. And uh, as the Adventist church, we are not impervious to this either. I'm not saying we're a a perfect church this morning. Amen? Uh, Far from it. So I don't want us to look at uh, this slide here and see that we're kind of at the top of the food chain. Amen? We're not not at the top of the food chain. We are just living to the light that God has revealed to his church in these last days. And uh, that we are sitting here this morning uh, again. experience that we saw there in Revelation 10. But of course, we see this Advent movement rally. They go back into the most holy place to try and find out what they had missed. And they find the Ark of the Covenant there. What significance does this Ark have? What's inside the Ark? The Ten Commandments. 
They find out the Sabbath truth, all of these amazing truths that seem to be all connected together that come out of this discovery in the most holy place in the sanctuary. And we see the catalyst for those Adventists there during uh, the time of George Miller to become these seventh, William Miller, sorry, to become these seventh day Adventists. And they come to the realization that uh, some of these markers that are very pertinent in identifying this remnant church that we see in Revelation 12, uh, they, they see there in Revelation 12, 17, where it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, this is prophetic imagery. Uh, the dragon represents who? Satan. Uh, the woman represents what? The church. And the seed of the offspring here represents Jesus. When Jesus became a man and uh, came down to earth and uh, to fill that prophecy that we see in Genesis 3. And uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. So we looked at a ton of information last week. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, these messages that we're preaching are just an overview. And I'd really suggest that if you want to uh, really understand these, these prophecies and these concepts that we find uh, in the book of Revelation and Daniel and these kinds of things, uh, then you should go and see Pastor Josh. And uh, he'll tell you all about it. We got, we got Pastor Harvey here today as well, so you can probably go and see him. But um, we are more than happy to, to resource you, to, to point you in the right direction, that you can study these things and, and come to a, a better understanding. So this remnant, or as we called it last week, the conclusive cast of Christ, will be known by two things. What are the two things we see here? That they will keep the commandments and that they will have the testimony of, of Jesus. Now, this morning, I'm going to say something fairly controversial. And uh, some of you may get upset. I know that Josh is looking probably a little bit nervous, probably Harvey as well. I, I was hoping they wouldn't be here this morning, actually. But um, here's the thing. This group that is at the top of these stairs here, the Adventist church, is not necessarily the same group as these ones here that keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. You see, this morning, there is a visible church and an invisible church. God has a visible church and an invisible church. And what I see, I see in these two defining markers here in Revelation 12, 17 is a theology. I mean, it's all about theology, but in regards to the personal experience of, of these people, I see the theology there in, in keeping the commandments, but I also see the testimony of Jesus, which I believe is an experiential thing. Amen? You've got to have that personal relationship with Jesus. Now, I know as good Adventists, we like to see uh, uh, the testimony of Jesus, and we relate it back to Revelation 19.10, don't we? The spirit of prophecy. And that is definitely legit. But I also think that it points to us having that personal experience with Jesus, that personal relationship with Jesus. And, um, you know, if you, were, if you were to ask me which one of these things were the most important, I would say what is more important, inhaling? or exhaling. They're both very important. Amen? Just as important as one another. And uh, in Matthew 13, Jesus teaches the parable of the wheat and the tears. And uh, we are all very familiar, of course, of what wheat is, um, but tears are a weed that look very much like wheat. Very hard to tell the difference. And uh, in this parable, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a, to a man who see, sowed good seed in his field. But while he was sleeping, an enemy came in and sowed uh, these weeds or tears. So when the seeds come up and the field was both full of wheat and tears, his servants asked him if they should go through the field and try and remove all of the tears. But the master says, don't do that because you might uproot some of the wheat. Basically saying, you will have a hard time differentiating between the two. And he says, just wait until, what? The harvest. Wait until the harvest. And the really interesting thing about uh, wheat and tears is, I don't know if you know this, but when wheat comes to full maturity, the head of it bows over. Whereas tears, they stand up straight and proud. 
So it's really interesting, you know, to, 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 to realize that and to recognize the spiritual application too, amen? That the wheat is bowed down in worship. But the tears, the weeds, they, they stand up in their self-righteousness, essentially. And uh, what Jesus is talking about here is, is this invisible and visible church concept. And uh, this is our present situation. This is God's church today. We have the visible church. Now, the visible church is the organized church. That's us today, the, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, and it is made up of both wheat and tears. But God also has an invisible church. And uh, the thing is that it is not our job to sort them out. Amen? It's not our job to sort them out. That is God's job. And, um, of course, man is only able to see the outward appearance. It is only Jesus that can see the heart, that can truly judge people for, for who they are and probably more importantly, whose they are. And uh, we're living in a time in, in church history that we call the church militant. We are the church militant. That is to say that every believer is in this cosmic conflict, this great controversy, this, this battle between good and evil. We are all engaged in spiritual warfare. There are two opposing influences that are continually exerted on the members of these churches. One influence, of course, is working for the purification of the church, and the other's mandate is to corrupt that church. So this is the current situation. But just before Jesus returns, we see a, a transfer. There is a, it's almost like an international exchange program where we see the unfaithful in the visible church, they leave, and then we have the faithful ones that are out there in the invisible church, they come in. They may have the testimony of Jesus, but at this time, they might not know about the commandments of God. But they're living to the light they know. Amen? And they are counted as being faithful. And they will become eventually this church triumphant. So this is the church just before Jesus returns. The church that is ready for, for Jesus' soon return. And these are the ones in Revelation 12 that are described as having conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is, this is the conclusive cast of Christ in this theater of grace that we find ourselves in. Now, the Adventist church that is now is most certainly God's vehicle for the advancement of the gospel. Amen? God is using the church to advance the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong this morning. You're all in the right place at the right time, at least physically. But this church who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus at the end of time, they are this remnant people that Revelation is talking about here. So we as the visible church play a big part in the church uh, that is going from this to this. Going from this church militant to this church triumphant. And that stems from what the mighty angel in Revelation 10 says right at the end there. Remember, we, we looked at it last week, but I'll bring it up for us again. Revelation 10 and verse 11, where it said, this is John speaking, and I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So as the visible church, we have a role to play again in this theater of grace. And our message this morning is called Knowing Our Role. So it's important that we know our role. Amen? It's important to know what part we, that God wants us to play uh, in this theater of grace. And it's interesting because I was looking at a play. Now, often a play is made up of three parts or three acts. And... Uh, it's, it's act one is called the setup, act two is the confrontation, and act three is the resolution. And I thought this was really interesting when I was looking at it, because it definitely has some application for us this morning as well, again, in this, in this theater of grace that we find ourselves in. So we're going to look at Revelation 14 this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, please open it up to Revelation 14. And uh, in Revelation 14, we find three very distinct 
prophetic messages that must go to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings, as it said there at the end of Revelation 10. And it is our role as we play our parts in this theater of grace to share these messages. So we just want to break these down a little bit. Uh, and again, this is just an overview. We can't, you know, we'd probably be here till uh, tomorrow afternoon if we were to really break them down. So yeah, again, this is just an overview. So we are picking it up in Revelation 14 and verse 6. Revelation 14 and verse 6. And God's word says this. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal or everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Does that sound familiar? And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So again, for the sake of time, this is just an overview this morning. You can pull a lot more out of these messages than what we're going to look at this morning. And again, I would encourage you to go and uh, check it out for yourself. So this is Act 1, the first angel's message. This is the setup. The setup. And again, this sounds a lot like what that mighty angel said at the end of Revelation 10. This is what that angel was saying would need to be prophesied again. Now, the first thing is the gospel. Amen? Is that the most important thing that we have, the gospel? It sure is, but what is, what is very specific about this gospel? That it is what kind of gospel? The everlasting or the eternal gospel. Now, it's very interesting because there are a lot of different gospels at the moment, isn't there? There's a lot of different Gospels, and um, I don't know if any of you have seen American Gospel. Have you seen this program? It's on Netflix. Really good. You should check it out. If you don't have Netflix, then you're better than I am. Um, and you can check it out on YouTube. They've got a truncated version that is uh, an hour long. Uh, the other one, I think, is about two hours long, but you definitely get the message in, in that YouTube uh, version. But watching that, you, you come to an understanding that there are some very interesting ideas around the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. But this everlasting gospel that we find here in Revelation 14, it points us all the way back to Genesis. Because the gospel isn't just a New Testament theme. Amen? It's not just a New Testament theme. You know, many dismiss the Old Testament today. They think that it is largely redundant for God's people as New Covenant Christians. But... The gospel that we preach is one that recognizes that the introduction of the gospel goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, after sin had infiltrated the garden, then God gave us that very first prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, where he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. Who are we talking about? Is the he is as Jesus shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The other way around, sorry. But the plan of salvation was put into effect the moment that sin came in. God took care of it as soon as it came in. And in Revelation 13, what does it call Jesus? Do you remember? The lamb slain from the, from the foundation of the world. That sounds like it goes all the way back to Genesis. Amen. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, another thing is that more and more we are seeing uh, Christendom, Christendom sorry, distancing themselves from the literal seven-day creation account. And you see here there is a, a real special emphasis on God as the creator. God is the creator in that first angel's message. We're also living in a time where many are distancing themselves from the fact that we are living in a time of judgment. Now, I guess that's because people find the judgment scary, maybe. But should the judgment be scary? It shouldn't. The judgment shouldn't be something that is used as a fear tactic. In verse 7, it does say to fear him, but this isn't about being scared of God. It's simply saying that we are to respect God. To respect him, to, to show the respect he deserves, to 
worship him because he is worthy of our worship. So a big part of the setup of this first angel's message is that fear shouldn't be a motivating factor when we share the gospel. Amen? Fear should have, have no part of our gospel sharing. When we point people to Jesus, anxiety and fear, these things should be cast out. And not just about the present, but the future as well. Amen? People should not have any fear about Jesus' soon return, unless, of course, they don't have a relationship with Jesus. But we need to know this morning our condition as sinful human beings. We need to be aware of our need to be able to come boldly to the throne of mercy and grace every day so that the judgment is of no concern to us. And I love that it says that, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? Does it sound like we have to come fearfully to God? We come boldly. He's expecting us to. And this is another aspect of the everlasting gospel is not just the good news that Christ died for our sins on the cross, but that he continues to mediate for us every day in heaven, dealing with the sin in our lives so that we can stand before God justified by Christ's righteousness. And so we must also emphasize that the law of God is still binding, that the commandments of God are still relevant for God's people today including, of course, the fourth commandment to observe the seventh-day Sabbath, which is a memorial to creation. So this is, this is act one. This is the setup for the first angel's message to remind people their need of Jesus, to respect God and worship him as our creator, to keep his commandments because we are living in a time of judgment. And then we come to act two. The confrontation, also known as the second angel's message. So if you're in your Bibles there, we're just going to the next verse in Revelation 14, verse 8. And God's word says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, we associate Babylon with spiritual confusion. If we go back uh, in, in time and in, into Bible times, we know that Babylon was opposed to Israel. It was opposed to God's people and uh, it enticed Jerusalem, God's people, into paganism and idolatry. And eventually, of course, it took the whole nation into captivity. And you'll remember that only a small remnant returned to the broken down city to build it back up again. And, of course, today we see uh, the church as spiritual Israel, don't we? And, uh, you know, it comes back to that verse from Galatians that we shared uh, last week, Galatians 3, 28 and 29, where it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, you are heirs according to the promise. So in a similar fashion that we see spiritual Babylon, which is this uh, confederacy of religious powers that opposes God at the end of time, to lead people astray and to take them captive through false doctrines and a distorted view of God's character, at the time, literal Babylon was leading God's people astray, God used someone by the name of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, to confront this pagan system, and to pronounce judgment on it. Notice this morning I'm talking about confronting a system, not a people. You know, this is very important this morning when we are confronting these things which are opposed to God, that we never frame it as an anti-people thing, but an anti-ideas thing, an anti-systems thing. We shouldn't be against people, but against the powers that are impairing people's perception of God by making them inebriated by this spiritual confusion that we see here. If you in your Bibles there, turn to Revelation 18. And uh, in Revelation 18, we see 
a, a very similar message to what we see here in Revelation 14, but there's a, a really important point that I want to point out here that speaks to the point that I'm making. So if you're in Revelation 18, it says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So it sounds just like Revelation 14, doesn't it? She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Now, I want you to see, just as we've read this here, that it is it seems to be not just talking about religious systems, does it? It seems to be incorporating pretty much every worldview that is in the world as opposed to that is opposed to God. And this is God here looking down on the entire world. And what does he see? If we carry on there in verse four, what does it say? Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my what? My people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plague. So when God is looking down on Babylon, what does he see? His people. Isn't that amazing? He sees his people. So we too, when we look at Babylon, we should see his people. He always looks at those who are far from him as having the potential to come back to him. Because all of these people he sees were all created by him in his image. You know, we need to see the lens, we need to see the world, sorry, through the lens of God. And we see that as we read in Ephesians 6. Again, it is not against flesh and blood that we wrestle against, but it's against principalities and these cosmic powers that oversee this present darkness that we find ourselves in. So again, we confront and we condemn structures and systems, not individuals. Especially when we consider the fact that many of these people that are in these systems and structures are making up this invisible church that we just talked about before. So act two, the confrontation. The second angel's message is to confront the spiritual confusion in the world that is based on systems and structures, but not condemn God's people that are caught up in them. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, one more thing just before we move on to the final act or, or the third angel's message. If we do a good job in our setup of presenting the everlasting gospel, the first angel's message, then it goes a long way to making the second and third angel's messages less confronting for people. Amen? I'll say that again. If we do a good job of setting up that first angel's message, then people will find the second and third angel's messages less confronting confronting. Now, the thing is that people may reject Jesus, or they're definitely going to reject Jesus, aren't they? That is more than likely going to happen as we share these things. But, you know, I want, I want us to keep one thing in mind, that people may despise us because of Jesus, but there is never an excuse for people to loathe Jesus because of his association with us. Does that make sense? We are to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves when we share these things. You know, the three angels' messages, they're in a, a specific order. God wants us to, to share that first one before we share the other two. And especially when you take it into context of if we're comparing it to a play. Could you imagine going to a play and seeing the second and third act before the first? Would you be confused? You would be, wouldn't you? So with the people out there when we try and share the second and third angel's message before we share the first. You know, God is not only telling us to confront the confusion that is out there, but sometimes I think we need to confront the confusion in here as well. Amen? There's a lot of confusion in the church as well. And so we move on to Act 3. And this is the third angel's message, the resolution. 
So again, if you're following along in your Bibles, we're picking it up in verse 9. Uh, this is quite a long one. Verse 9, the third angel's message, it says this. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which has poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And, there is, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, there is a, a lot to uh, unpack here. Uh, and again, this is just an overview, so we're not going to unpack it all. Um, we'll leave that for another time. But what this is saying is essentially it is giving us the consequences of staying in Babylon as it is falling. That's basically what it's telling us about, you know, as described there in the second angel's message. So essentially what we are seeing is this confederacy of religious powers opposed to God uh, coming together and enforcing, enforcing sorry, worship of this, this counterfeit religious system. And I find it interesting that, you know, it says there that the mark of the beast is received in the hand or in the head. This tells us that at the end of time, sorry, there will be people that will be worshipping out of conviction uh, and there will also be people that are worshipping out of convenience. The picture that we get from Revelation is that this isn't optional. This is a time when the world is polarised. And they are forced to make, what are they forced to make? Uh, a choice or a, or a, starts with R? Resolution. It's a, the third act, resolution. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about it. That's right. So they either resolve to capitulate to a, a liberty violating enforced man made religion or they resolve to join the resistance against this false system by pledging their allegiance to Jesus Christ. You know, when Ellen White talks about the third angel's message, uh, she claims that the third angel's message is justification by faith in verity. Have you heard that before? The third angel's message is justification by faith in verity. Now, verity isn't a word that we use very much anymore, is it? It's not a word that we use much these days. But what she's saying is that basically everything out of that big block of text that we just read, the most important takeaway is justification by faith in Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing. And I love what it says in Ephesians chapter two, where it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's important for us this morning to recognize that our own works get us nowhere, that we are, are fully dependent on the work that Jesus wants to do in us and through us by his grace. And that this grace of God will prepare us not only for his soon return, but the work that needs to be done through us to share these important messages that the world so desperately needs to hear. You know, we started out this morning in our message by identifying this, this conclusive cast of Christ. And we saw that this is the current state of, of the visible or the organized church, that it is made up of both uh, wheat and tears, both the faithful and the unfaithful. But just before Christ returns, those tears would leave and align themselves with this false religious system. And tragically, they miss out on being a part of this church triumphant. This church that is waiting for Jesus to come. And what is it that makes them leave? Well, the thing is, the sad truth is, is that they were never really there. 
You know, earlier I made the point that we are all here at the right place at the right time, physically. But you know, this is the sad reality for, for some in the church. Some of us are just here physically. We're not standing on the promises, we're just sitting on the premises. You know, it's like when God came down to the garden after the fall and and he calls out to Adam, he says, Adam, where are you? Now, did God know where Adam was? Of course he did. He's omniscient, he knows everything. God knew that Adam was hiding behind behind that bush, but he was asking a rhetorical question, wasn't he? He was asking Adam, where are you? Spiritually, where are you emotionally? Where are you mentally? And you know, it is the same question that God asks us today. Where are we today? Where are we today? Are we part of this visible or or this invisible church? Because those who endure at the end of time as a part of the invisible church uh, will be those who not only keep the commandments of God, but have a living, experiential faith grounded in the faith of Christ's righteousness. A group who long ago said it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in and through me. And everything I do is motivated by his power in me. Now, as I mentioned last week, this morning, church, I want to see that being a Seventh-day Adventist living in such a time as this is not something that we should be prideful of, but something, again, that we should find humbling. Because we recognize this, that God doesn't have a group of people at the end of time that he holds in a higher regard, but a group that he holds to a higher account. Before we close this morning, I just want to bring up that quote from God's amazing grace that we looked at last week again. God's Amazing Grace, page 338, where it says this, During ages of spiritual darkness, the church of God has been as a city set on a hill. From age to age, through successive generations, the pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, does the church appear ineffective sometimes? Enfeebled, sure does. Regardless of that, the church is the one object upon which God bestows, in a special sense, his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. Now, it's interesting there where it says, in a special sense, the church has his supreme regard. You think the thing is that it is not because we are a special people. Amen? It is because we have a special work. He holds that work in high regard. So with that in mind this morning, may we all seek God in all that we do so that we might be counted amongst this conclusive cast of Christ at the end of time. So that he can use us for his glory to set up an accurate and attractive picture of him according to Act 1, the setup. by by confronting, sorry, the false religious systems and structures in place in Acts 2, in that confrontation. And the opportunity, or giving the opportunity to people to resolve in their hearts and minds to give their lives to Jesus that we see in Acts 3, to make that resolution. And that is for us too as well, isn't it? That we are to make that resolution that we are to resolve in our hearts and minds as followers of Jesus to allow him to use us for his glory so that the work can be finished and he can soon return to come and get us. So let's pray. eh? Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We recognize this morning that we have covered a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, there's so much there. But we just wanted to give this this overview of what God's people would look like just before you return. Lord, we pray that we are not here just going through the motions, that we are keeping the 
the letter of your law, but that we are keeping the spirit of your law. That we have that relationship with Jesus that motivates us to keep your law. That it is not the root of our salvation, but it is merely the fruit of the work that you are doing in us and through us. We recognize, Lord, that there is a great work to do in this world to reach the world with the amazing truths that we find in Jesus. And uh, Lord, we have nothing to bring. And so we ask, Lord, that you work in us, that you give us the boldness, the tenacity, the resources and tools to be able to go out and share these amazing things with those who are out there that don't know you yet. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.